OK, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation um, to come here to talk. Um, I've very much enjoyed my visit. I've spoken to a lot of people doing uh, a huge number of uh, varied things in Jean-Marie's group, and it's been very stimulating. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in my group uh, in Oxford. Uh, the focus is on making uh, new materials. Uh, we're focusing on, as you can see, layered materials like these oxide chalcogenides, which I'll say a little bit about, where we've got, say, an oxide layer intergrown with these chalcogenide layers. So I'll say a little bit about the, um, how we can control the physics by doing chemistry in those compounds. And in similar vein, I'll talk a little bit about these iron-based <coughs> superconductors, uh, which emerged <coughs> um, a few years ago. <coughs> Again, the focus is on controlling, using chemistry to control the physics. <clears throat> and a lot of what we do is low temperature chemistry. So that's actually what I'm going to focus on in, in this lecture, focus on low temperature chemical routes to, um, to making new materials uh, in, these, in these classes. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people in my group um, uh, at the moment. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, several postdocs and students and, and undergraduate researchers um, we have important collaborations with uh, Oxford Physics, other colleagues in Oxford Chemistry, um, and uh, we're very reliant on international facilities for neutron, synchrotron X-ray, uh, and microscopy um, facilities, and we collaborate with colleagues like Claire Gray at Cambridge. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, work. <clears throat> um, and we're grateful to have funding from various uh, organisations, um, mostly in the UK. So uh, just to uh, introduce this, um, the first part of the talk is going to be on the iron-based superconductors. And I'm particularly going to focus on uh, the intercalation chemistry that we can do with, with iron selenide uh, in order to control the, uh, the composition, the electron count, and therefore the properties. Uh, so what we've done offers some uh, insights into the chemical factors that control uh, superconductivity in those compounds. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the chemistry and properties of these oxide chalcogenides. I'm going to focus on compounds with this structure, of which there are many. And I'm going to talk about how you can control the magnetism and, and physics in general of the transition metal oxide layer by doing chemistry in this uh, coinage metal chalcogenide layer. So the focus is going to be on doing soft chemistry. The overall concept is exploring new intergrowth compounds, we, because you can see all these compounds are composed of, say, a perovskite oxide block and these anti-fluorite type chalcogenide blocks. And it's a similar story uh, in the, um, in the iron-based um, superconductors. So that's a general, that's a general theme. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the superconductors and just a little bit of uh, a reminder of where superconductivities come from. Um, so superconductivity was discovered just over 100 years ago, um, and <clears throat> this was in elemental metals, and gradually the superconducting transition temperature edged up as people discovered superconductivity in a range of, of alloys, things like niobium-tin uh, into metallic compound, and the, and the alloy niobium-titanium are widely used in um, superconducting magnets. <clears throat> um, so those are, those are the main technological materials. <clears throat> in 1987, it was discovered that there were a whole class of these copper oxide-based uh, materials, layered cuprates. Uh, and they were discovered originally um, in derivatives of uh, lanthanum copper oxide. This yttrium barium copper oxide is one of the sort of best known. It was the first to superconduct above liquid nitrogen temperatures. And that one is being explored for commercial, um, commercial use. Um, it's a, they, these are compounds that defy a full uh, understanding of the physics and why they superconduct at high temperatures. Um, other compounds like magnesium boride were discovered, which have unusually high transition temperatures. And then, unexpectedly, there emerged this series of iron-containing materials, iron arsenide-containing uh, layered materials, <coughs> which were discovered uh, about, in about 2008. And there was a sort of rapid development uh, in these high TC materials. And again, these defy a full uh, understanding of the, of the physics. And how do you discover a new superconductor? So it's not easy. I mean, I would say the cuprates and the iron-based superconductors emerged 
um, somewhat by accident. People were doing sensible chemistry uh, in sensible, with sensible elements, uh, um, but you often don't know what you're going to discover. So I think that's a good guide. <laughs> um, in those compounds, superconductivity is close to magnetic order, so that's probably a good place to look. Um, doing chemistry is very important, as I'll show, because you often have to move away from the stoichiometric compositions to find interesting uh, properties dominated by mixed valence. Um, Bob Carver is an expert in this area, so he wrote a nice accessible article uh, a few years ago now, um, essentially saying that things are likely to emerge by accident. <coughs> um, he said, if that superconductor is made, if the next superconductor is made by doping concrete, I'll know it's time for me to retire. Uh, and sure enough, a year later, there was discovered by Hosono's group in, in Tokyo a concrete like material that's an electride, has electrons as some of the anions, and that shows superconductivity, albeit at low temperatures. So it's a, it's a very common phenomenon. Um, and I don't think Bob's retired yet, so. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we, we dis these, these materials were discovered in Hosono's group, um, as I say, and what they were, they were looking at compounds with this structure type. Uh, they were interested in transparent conducting oxides with this structure type. Uh, and they took this um, RN2 plus compound and they made a chemical substitution of some of the oxygen by fluorine. So this adds some electrons if you maintain the anion to cation ratio. And so it reduces the iron slightly. And <clears throat> in, that, in that compound, superconductivity emerged at, at an unusually high temperature, about 26 Kelvin. And that sort of fired the starting gun in a whole uh, range of um, researches around the world uh, investigating other compounds that had the iron arsenide layers. And in general, they all superconduct. Um, and you can control the compositions by carrying out chemical substitutions on the, on the counter ions. So substitute barium by potassium to this time whole dope, the system formally oxidized the iron, and that induces superconductivity. Uh, so uh, we, got in, we got involved with this. Um, so one of our contributions was uh, to work on uh, sodium iron arsenide uh, with this structure here. <coughs> and it sort of demonstrates the, the sort of generic phase diagram for these compounds. So, so sodium iron arsenide, when it's stoichiometric, is, a, is an antiferromagnet. Um, and <coughs> it shows a very small proportion of superconducting material. Uh, and it very soon edges into the fully superconducting regime if you substitute some of the iron by co cobalt. So this, this introduces some electrons. Um, it also introduces some disorder, which probably disrupts the magnetic order, ordered state. But very quickly, you emerge into this superconducting region. But these compounds have quite a complicated phase diagram. So in this region here, the magnetism and the superconductivity really coexist. Every iron atom participates in both states <clears throat> because there are sort of multiple bands uh, at the Fermi level. <clears throat> some of them are involved with magnetism, some of them are invo involved with superconductivity. So they're quite complicated materials, but <clears throat> like in the cuprates, like in the copper oxides, the antiferromagnetic state is close to the superconducting state. And it's suggested that magnetism, magnetic fluctuations are the thing that forms the, the Cooper pair uh, to support the superconducting state. And some of these are promising. So it's, it's only now, I guess, in the last uh, five to 10 years that the copper oxides are being exploited as um, materials for high field magnets. So for example, the, some of the highest field NMR magnets are incorporating now um, uh, nitrium, barium, copper oxide central portion in the, in the magnet. So the, those are becoming technological materials. There are challenges with making uh, wires and tapes out of them, um, but those are being surmounted. In terms of the iron-based compounds, uh, they're not yet uh, used technologically. Um, the generic phase diagram is shown here. Again, we've got this magnetic state. And then if you get the electron count right, you emerge into the superconducting regime. So <clears throat> um, if you start with barium iron arsenide here, uh, and compare it with potassium iron arsenide over here. They have the same, uh, same structure, uh, and you, you, there's a broad range of superconductors in this intermediate range, so a broad range of electron counts. Um, but of course, you've got, in this compound, 
uh, you've got disorder between the potassium and the barium. Um, and that, that hampers the properties a little bit, having chemical disorder. So you make a compound with the same electron count that's got uh, ordering between uh, the potassium and, in this case, calcium, because they're different sizes and charges they can order in this, in this compound. So now you've got a, um, a compound with no disorder, but it has exactly the right electron count to be in this sort of uh, sweet spot here for having a high TC. So this seems to be one of the um, most promising materials for making into, um, making into wires and tapes for potential uh, application. And they, it has quite a high critical current and a high, very high critical field. So it's um, got some desirable properties, but all these ceramic materials are quite a challenge to make into, to make into devices. Uh, so what I really want to focus on is, <clears throat> uh, you've seen how the electron count is important, so I want to demonstrate that in the context of, of materials based on iron selenide. So this is a lowish temperature superconductor in this, in this layered polymorph. So we've got uh, edge sharing um, FeSe4 tetrahedra. It's the anti-PBO uh, structure. Uh, and <clears throat> it's been explored a lot by, by um, physics groups trying to uh, you know, measure, the, measure the Fermi surface, understand uh, these, these compounds. And if you, to, to sort of cut a long story short, if you look at the bands that cross the Fermi level, um, there, are, um, there are bands that uh, dip down below the Fermi level and have a few electrons in them, and there are bands that poke up above the Fermi level and have a few uh, holes uh, in them. And it was discovered that if you put a monolayer of FeSe onto a, um, a substrate that is uh, an oxygen deficient strontium titanium oxide that injects some electrons into the film and you can fill up these holes uh, and this compound then superconducts at, at rather high temperatures. So that seems to be controlling this Fermi surface, uh, drives you away from the magnetic state into the superconducting state. And you can do a similar thing with a, this time with a bulk film of FeSe uh, decorated with potassium uh, atoms, which of course inject their electrons into the, into the solid, so it's a similar story. Uh, so can we, can we do, can we imagine intercalating into uh, iron selenide? Can we intercalate in here to add electrons? Because that seems to be what we need to do. Um, so there are some compounds that were examined, uh, which were sort of, you could think of as intercalates of, of iron selenide. They contain alkali metals in between iron selenide layers. But if you make these at high temperatures, uh, they're always iron deficient. For every uh, potassium or rubidium that you want to add, uh, or for, for, uh, for every, for every uh, two of those, rather, you remove one iron. So you maintain the electron count. <clears throat> um, and uh, so you generate a very highly deficient um, iron selenide layer, and the vacancies order in this pattern. Uh, and these compounds are basically antiferromagnetic insulators with localized moments on the iron 2 plus ions, except that if you measure some of the samples, um, you see evidence for superconductivity in filamentary regions where there seems to be no uh, iron deficiency and rather less of the alkali metal. Um, so several groups have explored those compounds. So the question is, can we, can we maintain these stoichiometric iron selenide layers and inject some electrons uh, by doing soft chemistry instead of working at high temperatures. Uh, and <clears throat> if, you, if you blast it with your classic lithiating agent, um, that, that you find that's too aggressive, so you extrude the elemental iron and make lithium selenide. Um, so that, that was our sort of first attempt at that. Um, but there are other sources of, of lithium, so metal ammonia solutions these, that form these beautiful solvated electron uh, solutions. Um, when you react that um, solution with, with iron selenide, you do get a metastable material. It was discovered by a group of Ying and co-workers, um, but the structure wasn't analysed. But it was clear that there was a compound um, <clears throat> where this was the sort of approximate structure. The nitrogen's a long way from anywhere else, so it can't quite be accurate. Um, and uh, the TC, though, has gone up to 40 Kelvin. So this is clearly something's happened. Um, to, the, uh, to the electronic properties. So we, um, we made a sample of this 
Uh, this was a time when there was still sort of quite feverish excitement in these compounds. Uh, so we, we have good access to neutrons at the ISIS facility. So we made a sample of this uh, with deuterium instead of uh, hyd uh, hydrogen, which is sort of more cooperative towards neutrons. And so you can refine then the whole structure and see that you're intercalating lithium, but you're also intercalating the solvent as well. Um, and we can locate all the atoms, including the light, lithium and, and deuterium. And you deduce from, from this and from chemical analysis uh, and from thermogravimetric analysis that um, the compound uh, contains um, quite a bit of lithium, uh, some amide formed by the um, reduction of ammonia and with the release of a little bit of hydrogen. Uh, but the overall, there are electrons injected, about 0.2 electrons per iron uh, injected into this compound, which um, is, is sufficient to drive it into the superconducting regime. Uh, and so it's very similar in composition to these filamentary regions, which were deduced to have this sort of composition. And we've, we've re retained this stoichiometric iron selenide layer. Uh, so we wanted to we wanted to look at um, we wanted to look at how that compound forms by doing a an in situ X-ray diffraction experiment uh, of this iron selenide reacting with this metal ammonia solution. So <clears throat> again, we have good access to facilities very close to Oxford at the Diamond Light Source, uh, and there's a, a colleague of mine, Dermot O'Hare, had already done some experiments. Um, looking at um, chemical transformations uh, using this um, versatile beamline uh, that is used for a whole range of um, experiments from looking at strain in aircraft wings uh, to uh, exploring chemical processes. And basically, it's, a, it's an intense X-ray beam, quite hard X-rays, um, and, um, and a very sensitive detector, uh, and you can measure a full diffraction pattern in, in less than a second. So what we did was, was set up um, a suitable glass Schlenk tube uh, in this beam, <coughs> turned the beam on, and then we had a way of tilting by remote control this system so the iron selenide would fall into the reaction mixture and it would be sort of stirred immediately while we were observing it in the, um, using the diffractometer. So this is two minutes of beam time uh, here. Whoops. Uh, we've got the, um, the background here is because of the liquid and glass. If the iron selenide falls in, you see um, these peaks grow in, but then very quickly they're replaced by a new phase that's growing in. So this doesn't take very long, as I say, a couple of minutes, and these iron selenide peaks have sort of gone away and re been replaced completely by the product uh, that, we're, that we're forming. Uh, here's a... Here's a so it's a very simple, this is really just a glass, um, thick-walled glass uh, Schlenk tube modified with this little arm to contain the iron selenide made by our glass blower so that it's sort of safe for use with ammonia at room temperature. It's the most worrying thing about these experiments is the, the pressure inside that vessel. We can do it at low temperatures using this sort of rudimentary cryostat. Um, and the product that we made, well, we were expecting to make the compound that we'd analysed using neutron diffraction. Um, and uh, we would have expected to see um, a compound with a, <clears throat> the first diffraction peak, which is characteristic of the iron-iron iron separation, would be about eight angstroms. But it was much larger than that. So the product that we'd actually made was one that was not the same as the compound we, we'd explored before. And of course, we are doing this experiment and probing it while the sample is suspended in uh, liquid ammonia. Uh, and we discovered that we'd made an ammonia-rich phase. So we, uh, that's why this separation is larger. Uh, and that's the Riefeld refinement. Uh, so this is, the, this is the picture that we've got. When we do this reaction in liquid ammonia, we first of all make this ammonia-rich phase where the lithium is strongly solvated. Uh, and then in the lab, um, when we're preparing dry material, of course, we allow the ammonia to evaporate off. Then we evacuate and you lose half the ammonia, but you can put it back in. If you know that this phase exists, you can make it by <coughs> exposing the sample to ammonia at low temperatures. So we, we were able to do that and generate the neutron diffraction pattern, uh, which enabled us to locate all the atoms again uh, in, this, in this phase. 
Electronically, so this is now a non-redox process, so these two compounds are very similar in their superconducting properties, both TCs of about 40 Kelvin. Uh, in fact, <coughs> 40, 45 Kelvin, maybe. Um, depends where you're standing. Um, so, so again, it, we've, we've got about 0.2 electrons per ion in these, in these compounds. And, and we've, we can do this chemistry with, with all, the other, all the other ammonia-soluble metals essentially intercalate into iron selenide, so the, 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 um, the, alkali, the other alkali metals, calcium down to barium and, uh, and, and the europium and ytterbium can all be dissolved in ammonia and intercalated. Um, every system is a little bit different, but the similar story is that you increase the electron count, reduce the iron, and make a high temperature superconductor. So effectively what we're doing is uh, what has been done in these iron selenide systems and fill up these uh, holes. So, um, so we, I'm now going to talk about another system where uh, we're explore, again, ex again controlling the electron count and controlling the properties, um, but it's a slightly richer system in terms of the um, range of phases that we make. Um, once you know what you're looking for, you can sort of go looking for it. So we're looking for compounds with pristine sort of iron selenide, uh, iron calcogenide layers, iron slightly reduced to fill up those holes. Uh, and it's also been suggested that two-dimensional materials um, are desirable. In other words, if you've got a, um, a large separation between the layers. And there was a report of a hydrothermal synthesis that led to compounds that had a high um, superconducting temperature, um, although the composition wasn't entirely clear. So we sort of followed that work up uh, and this, using this sort of intermediate temperature hydrothermal method where you put simple reagents into a Teflon liner that goes inside one of these stainless steel autoclaves and does up like that uh, and uh, heat that at about 200 uh, degrees, um, work under very basic conditions to avoid making things like hydrogen selenide, uh, and you make incredibly crystalline material. This is the powder pattern from the light diamond synchrotron. Um, and you can do single crystal X-ray diffraction on the sufficiently large crystals. Uh, and what you deduce is that you've got iron selenide layers, but then there are a whole lot of atoms that, well, they, were about, they looked about the same as oxygen in terms of their scattering of X-rays, but they were a long way from the selenium. Um, so the structure didn't really make sense until you do the neutron experiment. And then you can deduce that you've made a hydroxide selenide. So there are hydroxide ions here, a sensible hydrogen bonding distance to the selenium. Uh, and we've got a, a layer here that is mostly lithium hydroxide, but some of these atoms in the middle are iron, uh, which is why with this mixture, it's, it sort of simulated an oxygen in the X-ray. Uh, the electron count was a weighted average of of those, it's about 20% iron, 80% lithium. Uh, and the other thing that's variable is the iron content in the selenide layer, and that depends on the precise iron content in the synthesis. So what we, what we discovered as a consequence of that uh, is that there are a whole range of properties, um, variable transition temperatures. So some of the compounds were not superconducting at all. They never became diamagnetic, uh, others, uh, were diamagnetic superconducting, therefore, but at various temperatures. And there was also a range of lattice parameters um, for, for, these, for these compounds. So there was obviously a phase width. Uh, and, and so we correlated those things. And it's clear that the, the compounds with the, um, well, the longer C parameter and the shorter A parameter uh, were the superconductors. And the refined iron content in the selenide layer was almost 100%, so almost fully occupied, 95 to 100%. Um, but then the compounds that were not superconducting had a different set of cell parameters and quite a deficiency of iron, so down to 15% you know, deficient uh, in, these, in these cases. Uh, and you could make a sample, um, measure the lattice parameters, and predict accurately the TC. So it's very robust correlation between whether they superconduct uh, or not, and what the TC is, uh, and that, that's this that's this correlation. So, the iron site occupancy turn when it's a certain amount, it turns on superconductivity, 
and that correlates with the iron oxidation state being slightly reduced, um, which I flagged up earlier as being important. Uh, and if you probe the position of the um, iron K edge, it's at lower energy, i.e. the iron is reduced for the superconductors, slightly reduced relative to iron selenide. The iron deficient materials have a iron in a higher oxidation state, so it's all consistent. Um, uh, so we've got this range of materials, some of which superconduct. Um, this, this slide shows the importance of <coughs> um, doing post-synthetic chemistry. Um, <coughs> uh, and um, we, we naively thought <coughs> that perhaps we could inject more electrons by inserting lithium into the vacant sites. <coughs> Here, so a student, master student, uh, reacted lithium ammonia with with these, these compounds made hydrothermally. And the consequence was that uh, a, a slightly mediocre looking superconductor was uh, turned into one with a much higher TC, a sharper transition, a larger diamagnetism, so a larger volume fraction. So why is that? Um, the crystallinity is retained, so that's good news because it means we can do a, a before and after neutron diffraction experiment um, to look at, look at what changes uh, when we do this lithiation. And we did this on, in two cases. Uh, so one of which uh, was this moder modest superconductor. The other one was one that didn't superconduct at all because it had a very, um, a very low lith iron occupancy in the selenide layer, uh, in the, the parent material. So what we discovered when we did the lithiation, um, we discovered that the iron occupancy increased to 100% in this layer. Uh, in both cases, in whichever, you know, whatever it was to begin with, it increased to 100% when we reacted with lithium ammonia. And the lithium occupancy in the um, selenide layer increased uh, by the same amount. Uh, so we're inserting lithium into this layer, uh, and <clears throat> but we're not changing the total amount of iron in the compound, because what's happening is the lithium is entering the hydroxide layer, and it displaces remember the 20% of iron that we had in this layer is being displaced, part of it is being displaced, to fill the vacancies. Uh, so we can make our sort of pristine iron selenide layer and introduce electrons by inserting the lithium, uh, lithium atoms effectively from the lithium ammonia solution. Uh, so we've got a reductive intercalation that also um, makes, a, makes us a stoichiometric iron selenide layer. So uh, and this is the <coughs> derivative of the iron absorption edge, so it shifts to lower angles, consistent with the reduction of iron. Uh, so again, it's <coughs> the same same argument that we're we're filling up we're filling up these holes uh, and turning on high temperature superconductivity uh, in these compounds. So there is a consistent picture emerging about the, how we can control these iron selenides, and it's sort of robust from uh, from series to series. And you can you can even you can probe a lot of you know, th that those pictures are, are sort of derived from experimental uh, measurements of the um, the angle result photo emission spectroscopy, which you can do on single crystals of these lithium hydroxide selenides made by other groups, uh, as well as the deposited iron selenide films. You can see that you you've got a full <coughs> electron. Uh, sorry, you've got a full hole pocket. You've got no holes left. It's been filled with, with the injected electrons. Um, so the, the next stage, so it's, it's then important to um, look at a series of reagents. Different reagents may give you different results. So we, we did this lithiation on these compounds using two other reagents, lithium naphthalenide. Uh, so the naphthalenide radical anion is the uh, reductant so this, is, this behaves, in this case, very similarly to lithium ammonia. Uh, and we, we, we did this, react. the reason there's so much data here is that we did this um, using the in-situ setup. We wanted to look at what happened. And very quickly, the lattice parameter um, increased as we, did, as we lithiated, and then it was flat, so the reaction was over. Uh, in this case, we started with a compound that was more iron deficient, so there was a greater change. We inserted more lithium displaced more iron, but again, the reaction stopped pretty quickly. But what we discovered 
uh, was that um, with butyl lithium, which is a more robust lithiating agent, uh, much less easy to decompose than lithium naphthalenide or lithium ammonia, that the reaction carries on going. So the lattice parameter doesn't stop changing <coughs> um, in either case. And in fact, it sort of saturates at a similar, similar point. Uh, so what we deduced here is that when you do this initial lithiation um, with lithium naphthalenide or lithium ammonia, you don't get beyond the point where you've inserted lithium and displaced sufficient iron to fill these vacant sites. <clears throat> Anything else requires a more robust um, lithiating agent because the next stage is to insert, if you want to insert more lithium, there's still some iron remaining in this layer but it can't go into vacant sites. It's got to be ejected completely from the structure. Uh, so that's the sort of thing, elemental iron is the sort of thing that's going to de decompose your lithiating agent if it's a fragile one like lithium ammonia or lithium naphthalenide. But butyl lithium is more robust, so it just keeps, keeps on churning uh, and lithium keeps coming in until we eject um, all the iron either into these sites or completely out of the structure. Uh, so we can see that here, that uh, in, the, in the fully over-lithiated compound um, where we've used butyl lithium, the iron content has dropped. <coughs> we've got a stoichiometric lithium hydroxide layer and a stoichiometric uh, iron selenide layer. We've got a very magnetic sample because it contains some elemental lithium, uh, sorry, <laughs> elemental iron, uh, and we've, we've lost our superconducting transition. So we've turned off the superconductivity because we've now made a compound where the iron is not reduced below the plus two state in this stoichiometric material. So we, we've accessed, if you like, the parent, what you might think of the, as the parent compound, uh, the stoichiometric compound uh, of, these, of this series, but you have to access it via this multi-step process. You can't get there, as far as we know, uh, directly. Um, but the, the composition, the refined composition from a combination of X-ray and neutron measurements um, supports the idea that it's fully stoichiometric. Um, and using the structural parameters that we derive, Rosa Valenti uh, and her group um, calculated the Fermi surface and deduced that indeed we did, because we've got iron in the plus two state, uh, we've got this whole pocket again, um, which is a signature of not superconducting, which is consistent with our, with our measurements. Okay, so, so hopefully I've, I've shown you um, the chemical factors that control superconductivity in these iron selenides. Um, and um, there's, a, there's quite a rich chemistry here. Um, we've got this, these solvent-rich phases that we can make using the metal ammonia uh, intercalations there in equilibrium with solvent-poor systems. Um, and we've, we've also... Um, very clearly come up with the chemical parameters that influence whether these compounds superconduct or not. Uh, and, and the in situ reactions, I think, are important. So we've done a few more. Uh, we've done this. This reaction is very similar in bismuth selenide, for example. It doesn't do anything electronically very exciting, but it's, you, can make this, um, you can make this range of ammonia-rich and ammonia-poor phases with other layered chalcogenides. And the in situ reactions sort of sometimes enable you to discover these metastable compounds. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is uh, <clears throat> still, some, still some soft chemistry, but in a different class of compounds and, and sort of with a different aim. Um, for, for a while, we've been looking at these layered oxide calcogenides with perovskite type oxide layers, for example, and then antifluorite type copper calcogenide layers normally, um, so copper sulfide or copper selenide layers here, and, and you can sometimes make those with, um, with thick copper sulfide layers. <clears throat> um, this, this, uh, this structure is very versatile. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. We can carry out a lot of, a lot of substitutions. Uh, and and these, these compounds as a whole are... Um, uh, Remembers of a sort of my more diverse extended family of these layered uh, <coughs> um, oxide calcogenides and oxide pnictides. Um, Laurent Cario's group has also done quite a lot of, in Nantes, has also done a lot of work on these layered, um, layered materials. <coughs> uh, and so we're, we're, 
we're always trying to look at new members of these. This structure, as I said, is quite common and it exists amusingly in the sort of anti-type um, where you exchange cations and anions or even discovered by Canatsidis' group, a sort of half anti-type where you retain the copper sulfide, copper selenide layers, but you've got a, an anti, the anti-type of this metal oxide layer is a um, four coordinate oxygen by the metals instead of a four coordinate metal by the oxygens. So there's, there's a lot of versatility in these, in these compounds. Uh, you can put a lot of different metals in the oxide layer, uh, typically mid to late transition metals. You can also often support compounds with, with a range of uh, transition metals in the chalcogenide or, um, or pnictide layer. And the thing we're doing is stabilizing unusual coordination environments for transition metals. So this very distended, <coughs> um, this very distended coordination environment for a transition metal is, is not so commonly encountered in oxides. So we're able to, to make, um, to make uh, compounds with, you know, with different ligand field characteristics. And you can carry out a lot of substitutions of all these sites effectively to control um, electron count and um, lattice parameters. Uh, so you can substitute strontium by barium or calcium, sulfide by selenide or telluride. You can put um, a range of um, metals in, in, these, in these layers. Uh, so uh, the, the soft chemistry uh, angle started when we were investigating the cobalt-containing compound with a COO2 layer and a copper sulfide layer. So uh, this, is a, this is an antiferromagnetic compound. We were interested in measuring the magnetic moment um, and we discovered if we did a series of measurements uh, using neutron diffraction, we discovered inconsistent results. So sometimes we had a, um, a large magnetic moment, <coughs> other times we had a much smaller ordered magnetic moment and we weren't quite sure what this was, uh, what, the, what the reason for this was. Um, but then we, we, we discovered, um, we did an experiment where we took one sample uh, and measured it and then we exposed it to air, moist oxygen, um, and we were able to change its ordered moment, decrease that a lot. We changed the cell volume significantly and we changed the refined copper content in the sulphide layer by about 5%. So that, those are significant changes. <coughs> um, the crystallinity is retained and you see evidence for a little bit of copper oxide forming. So what we're doing is de deintercalating a little bit of copper by exposure to moist air. Uh, and this, is an this oxidizes the cobalt a little bit and um, introduces disorder uh, and reduces the moment the ordered moment. So, so that gave us a clue that we could do chemistry in these chalcogenide layers. And we've exploited that further. So if you start from the silver containing compound, you can intentionally deintercalate silver using iodine <coughs> in solution. <coughs> uh, and you can turn the antiferromagnetic um, compound, stoichiometric compound, into uh, a compound that shows a ferromagnetic transition at low, low temperatures. And, and you don't see any sign of um, you don't see any magnetic brag peaks anymore. So we're, we're exactly trying to understand exactly why this is, whether it's become an itinerant ferromagnet or, uh, or not. It's slightly elusive at this stage. But we can, we can change the physical properties dramatically. Um, and I'll show that a little bit more in the context of the um, analogues with manganese oxide layers. So this is there's a series of compounds with MnO2 layers. Um, with chalcogenate layers of different, um, different thickness. <coughs> and the interesting thing about these is, because manganese is rather more oxidizable than cobalt, you can stabilize an oxidation state between plus two and plus three <coughs> um, by incorporating a copper deficiency in the materials made at high temperature. So in, this, in the case of manganese, if you make these at high temperatures, they're already copper deficient, um, even before we've done any deintercalation. Uh, so a quarter of the sites in this compound are vacant uh, and the manganese oxidation state is um, plus two and a half. <clears throat> um, and the, the vacancies, the copper ions and the vacancies order at low, on cooling. So they're disordered at high temperatures, but there's some diffuse scattering in the electron diffraction pattern, which crystallizes. And you see new Bragg peaks emerge in the X-ray diffraction pattern because you get ordering 
of the vacancies on the long range. Um, so the copper must be pretty mobile uh, in that case. Uh, and <clears throat> the magnetic structure of these is dominated by the mixed valence. So there's, there's work to be done on these compounds uh, for comparison with mixed valent oxide manganites where oxidation states between plus three and plus four give very interesting physics. Here we're between plus two and plus three, but like in the oxide manganites, we see um, prevalence for um, ferromagnetic ordering, in this case in zigzag chains uh, in the structure uh, as a result of the mixed valence. <coughs> Uh, we can uh, deintercalate some of the copper again using iodine, so we can take out another 10% of the copper, retain the crystallinity. Um, <clears throat> the manganese gets a little bit oxidized, but the copper doesn't get oxidized. Um, and the properties, the structure and the properties change. So the structure now we've got to accommodate a third of the copper sites being vacant. So this is this is work done with Yoka Hardeman, who did the um, Hard of stem imaging and you can see here we've got a copper occupancy wave so you've got bright spots here a lot of copper um, dimmer spots brighter spots dimmer spots very good at this time of day when you've got slightly half closed eyes uh, you can see that pattern very clearly this is a cartoon of it um, high copper occupancy low copper occupancy on a period with a periodicity that's several unit cells the structure we had a lot of help from Artyom Abakumov um, in analyzing this incommensurate um, ordering of the um, copper ions and vacancies on the long, on the long scale. The magnetism changes. Um, so instead of these ferromagnetic zigzag chains now, uh, we've got ferromagnetic stripes. Um, so um, unshaded is spin up, shaded is spin uh, pointing away from you. Um, and this structure is consistent with us having oxidized the manganese. We've now got two manganese threes for every manganese two. So between manganese three and manganese two, it's a ferromagnetic interaction. Between manganese three and manganese three, it's an anti-ferromagnetic interaction. It can be used to account for that uh, structure. So by doing that deintercalation, we change the, the magnetic state very significantly. Okay, so the, um, the, the related soft chemistry that we've done um, is more relevant to the sort of battery uh, context and it involves taking these compounds. We deduce that the copper is pretty mobile. It's pretty disordered. It's like, it looks like a fast iron conductor uh, in the, um, when you solve the structure, the copper is very sort of delocalized. Uh, so you can react this with butyl lithium. It's work we did a little while ago and you can make this compound into one with a lithium sulfide layer and all the copper is extruded onto the surface of the particles. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you can reverse that so you can either by exposure to air, um, uh, you can deintercalate the lithium and the copper from the surface gets reinserted uh, or you can uh, put this in a battery. So this is work we did in collaboration with Claire Gray um, and so you, you, you make a cell with this as the cathode material. You discharge to make the fully lithiated material. You see that there's elemental copper uh, here produced. Um, this is the first peak in the diffraction pattern, which is characteristic of the C lattice parameter. And then you charge up. If you charge up to 2.7 volts, um, you don't seem to have got rid of much of the copper, but you've made the structure collapse the lattice parameter has greatly decreased. <clears throat> so this isn't a single phase material, it turns out. So it's deceptively good looking refinement. Um, if you overcharge this a little or charge it to a higher voltage, then you do insert all the copper uh, and you go back essentially to the parent material with copper um, sulfide layers. So you get and you've got no, no longer any, any elemental copper and it's more crystalline as well. So, um, we wanted to sort of explore what was happening in this intermediate uh, region. Um, and the question really is, well, have we, at that point, have we got a compound where we've essentially removed all the metal from this sulfide layer, <clears throat> um, oxidized the metal, and then, uh, as Jean-Marie was saying uh, in his talk, uh, well, you can only oxidize the metal so far. Presumably, you have to start oxidizing the anion, the sulfide, 
Um, so can we do that? So this is recent work that uh, um, Shinsuke Sasaki has carried out. So he was, uh, he was in Nantes as a postdoc. Um, he came, worked in my group, um, basically during the pandemic. <laughs> so he, he took the last flight from Nantes in 1st of April 2020 or something, managed to, managed to arrive in Oxford, was in lockdown for about two months. Um, so didn't get into the lab, but then he did a huge amount of work. So the, the step that he took was to take these compounds where you've done the, you've done the lithiation and you've got these, this lithiated material contaminated with surface copper. Uh, and the thing we hadn't been able to do was just dissolve that away. Uh, not, not a trivial exercise. So what he came up with was a method of using this disulfiram reagent to do an oxidative... Um, oxidative deintercalation of the lithium, but also a dissolution of the copper because it chelates it, oxidizes it, and chelates it. Uh, so, so with a couple of cycles of um, dissolving away the copper, uh, then lithiating again to flush out any remaining copper in this sulfide layer, going around that cycle a couple of times, and then a final delithiation step, uh, he's basically been able to make... Um, make this what we call a collapsed phase where the lithium and copper have been um, completely deintercalated and, we've, and we're forming sulfur-sulfur bonds uh, between, the, between the layers. So uh, the evidence, uh, is comp the structure is complicated. Um, the manganese doesn't really get oxidised. Uh, in fact, it's not as oxidised as when we just used iodine to take out a bit of the copper. Um, instead, we, we see evidence uh, in the x-ray absorption edge um, for the sulfur edge we've got this pre-peak which is characteristic of um, forming disulfides you see exactly the same this this looks exactly the same as in barium disulfide bas2 for example um, so so we've we've evidence we've oxidized the sulfur uh, and there's evidence from the <coughs> the heart of stem imaging uh, shows um, blocks completely consistent with this, with this structural model. Um, uh, the, <clears throat> um, because it's gone monoclinic, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of stacking disorder. So <clears throat> sometimes you're looking at the layer this way, other times you're looking at it from the side um, and with the sulf sulfide units um, aligned in that direction. So there's a sort of stacking disorder, um, which makes the powder diffraction pattern relatively difficult to interpret, but you can do all sorts of stacking fault refinements now, which allow you to, um, with, a, with a fairly simple model and introduce some stacking, you can, you can refine a, an overall structural model. And Simon Cassidy in the group is expert at that. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and there's also um, evidence <clears throat> that um, you, can, you can make compounds where you've got um, a mixture of the completely deintercalated um, region and one that retains some copper or lithium. Uh, so this comes out of the heart of stem imaging. So you can see there are layers here that are not empty. So these are sulfide layers that are not empty and these are the empty ones. So you've got a sort of intergrowth of, um, of, those, <coughs> of those two types of, of layer. Uh, so it's, <coughs> it's not a simple system and there may be other, there may be ways we can control this and sort of make a uh, make a, uh, a sort of, I don't know, almost like a staged deintercalation where we've got alternating layers like this and layers like this. So that's, that's what we're exploring at the moment. <clears throat> so, um, so I think the summary, uh, what I wanted to talk about is that these are, these are pretty versatile uh, compounds. Um, in, in these oxide calcogenides that I've discussed, we can, we can harness the, the high metal ion mobility and the redox chemistry both on the chalcogenide and on the metal to, to make new compositions and, and tune the physical properties. Um, and the physical properties in these compounds and in the iron superconductors are very sensitive to the electron count and the, and the composition. Uh, and I think the most important lesson that we keep learning is that unusual behaviour uh, may emerge without warning. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank, uh, I've acknowledged these people already, I just uh, a reminder, we got together for a before we had to uh, give, up, um, <clears throat> give up social activity just before Christmas. We did at least get our Christmas dinner in because Shinsuke was about to leave 
So we, we brought it forward into November. Um, but he was, he's been sort of instrumental in um, generating new directions in the, in the group. Uh, and with that, I'd like to um, finish. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.